Guys, how are you doing? My name is Jerry Miller. Welcome to the I Love Seville show. Today is Tuesday, and it's fantastic outside. It's a great day to be alive. Um, I kind of feel spring in the air. I know it's kind of early here in February, but it gets me excited. Um, you know I love connecting with you through the I Love Seville network. We're live in Charlottesville, Albemarle County, Central Virginia, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world. And today's show, we're going to spotlight Computers for Kids, a fabulous <laughs> organization that is doing some really good things um, in Charlottesville. Um, Kayla Somerville is our guest, Jill Luwama Overstreet, our guest as well, and we're going to introduce you to these fantastic ladies and their mission and their philosophy and what they're doing with Computers for Kids in our town. Um, we feature the best of Charlottesville, Virginia, we just try to tell the story of people doing good things. That's what the whole show is about positive, good things in our community gaining the spotlight. Before we welcome the ladies to the show, let's thank some of our clients. We are an advertising agency at VMV Brands and I Love Seville. As of this morning, it was 114 clients um, on our roster. Two of our favorites are Interstate Pest and Service Companies and Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. Any branding or advertising that interfaces with the marketplace originates on the second floor of our building with our team. Um, and Dr. Wagner and Interstate, just like Computers for Kids, doing good things for the community. Interstate started in 1969 with the first generation, Mr. Robert Wells. He used his personal truck and pay phones around Charlottesville to build a business. Today, four generations of family are running the company. They have almost 100 team members all in the local market in a commonwealth-wide working footprint. Truly a success story. Just like Dr. Wagner, it's physical therapy, chiropractic care, and sports medicine. Dr. Wagner is changing people's lives. And Scott Wagner, chiropractic and sports medicine. Our team is only as strong as our team members, just like any organization. And Judah Wickhauer is our North Star that keeps the show sailing in the right direction. Thank you, Judah, our director. Why don't we go to the studio camera and welcome Kayla and Jill to the program. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. Why don't we start with you? Um, I guess introduce yourself to the viewing public, kind of your passions, your hobbies, your interests, and what you're all about. Absolutely. Well, my name is Kayla Somerville. I am, depending on who you ask, kind of sort of a native of Charlottesville. I've lived in Charlottesville for all but nine months of my life. So if you're born in Charlottesville, you would say I am not a native. But anyone who's been here for 10 years or more, count me as a native. I think so. that's a native. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up going through the Charlottesville City Public Schools. I'm a big supporter of public education and making sure that all of our youth have access to the education and tools that they need to be successful. Um, hobbies. As a working mother of a young child, there's not a lot of time for hobbies. Um, I'm fortunate in that when I go to work, it almost feels like a hobby because it's every day is filled with new surprises, wonderful people, and an amazing group of youth that we get the pleasure of serving. Awesome. Great answer. Jill, same question. Let's get you in the mix. The well-traveled Jill on the program <laughs> here. What are you all about, Jill? Hi, um, my name is Jill. I uh, actually came to Charlottesville in August of this year, so um, a re transplant. Re yes, a transplant <laughs> for sure. Um, I actually grew up uh, mostly in Central America and Africa myself, but um, have lived in the U.S. You know, I went to high school in Arlington, Virginia, near uh, D.C., and uh, went to college in Minnesota. So most recently coming from Minnesota as well. I've spent a little bit of time there. So um, I'm, I've been loving Charlottesville every second of it. It's a wonderful city. It has so much going on and such a, such a good heart in general. So I've really been, I've really appreciated all the connections I've had a chance to make. Um, a little bit about my interests and hobbies. I. Uh, um, I'm a huge theater geek. I'm also, I guess, an artist in my own right. I graduated. I had an art major um, in college. Um, and I actually, interesting fact about me, I boxed in college as well. So uh, Did not I didn't know that. And I was a volleyball player. So A boxer yeah. mm -hmm. in college. Super cool. <laughs> that may uh, change how we do the evaluation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you better be nice. Yeah. You're going to get a jab. Exactly. Uh, okay. So here's the cool thing of today's show. You can write comments to the ladies in the comment section any of the 12 Facebook pages, and I will relay your perspective, the viewer's perspective, on air. For example, 
Peaches Johnson oh, has said, my yeah. beautiful Kayla, oh. <laughs> giving you some love right awesome. now. Awesome. Thanks, Peaches. She's one of our first C4K students. Nice, nice. <laughs> Constance Wyatt, welcome to the program. Cecilia Cohen, hello. You're getting props from Nikki in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Elizabeth Portsbowski. Uh, oh yeah, watching. One of our mentors. Yeah, mentors. Is she watching in Texas right now? Uh, she or she's should from be. Texas. She's from Texas. Okay. It's actually her birthday today. Okay, oh, fantastic. Happy birthday, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, Brad Crowder, Neil Williamson, the Seville Weekly, Daily Progress, and Aaron King. Welcome to the show. Okay, we're gonna do this. Computers for kids. <laughs> Introduce us. All right. Well. It's sort of deceiving, right? Computers for kids. So what do you think we do? Work with kids and provide them computers. Well, that's what we did 20 years ago. Um, we are celebrating our 20th birthday this year. Nice. And we have grown up and evolved. When our, program, when our program first started, there was a need for youth to have a computer in the household. And we took a survey and found that there was almost a direct correlation between the number of students who did not have a computer but wanted one and who qualified for the free and reduced lunch program. Ooh, give me that again. So it was almost a direct correlation between those who wanted a computer and who qualified for free or reduced lunch program. So there was definitely a economic piece to this. And so what we decided to do is start a program that would not only put computers in the households because having a computer without the tools to use it could make it become a gigantic paperweight. So we started out as a computer mentoring program. We invited youth from our community to join C4K. Their commitment would be to meet with the mentor one hour a week for at least once a week, and they would come in and develop complex technology projects that were of interest to youth. Um, one, there are lots of things about us that have changed, but there are fundamental things have not changed, such as we are youth-driven. Everything we do is determined by the youth, what they want to learn. We don't have a prescribed curriculum. It's, hey, what do you want to explore? What do you want to know? And um, so that's how we got our start, bringing kids in, providing them with mentoring, and then they had an opportunity to earn a free computer. Those computers at the time were desktops that were donated by community members, refurbished by volunteers, and then put into the households of the youth That's we serve. That's awesome. And that was awesome. It was fun. It was great. But then we realized, wait a minute, these little things that we carry in our pockets, everyone, you know, computers became much more accessible. And so we thought, well, mentoring is still so important. And we didn't want to give that up. So we started thinking about how could we grow and expand to meet the needs of our, of our young people. Because that's what it's all about, right? What are the needs of our young people? And we realized that to be competitive in today's workforce, you need to have more than just computer skills. And so that's when we expanded our programming to incorporate STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So we remain true to our mission, which is we're still a one-to-one -one mentoring program. But in addition to that, we have a maker space and an audio studio and a green screen or green room where students can do video production. And they still get the one-to-one -one mentor, but there's also space that they can come in and work with group mentors and um, explore. So the one-to-one -one mentor, they're really digging deep, really learning some um, hard skills. And the clubhouse, which Jill can speak more to, um, is really an opportunity for kids to be exposed to new things, have an opportunity to play and explore in a non-threatening environment, an environment where they're not getting graded, where they're not being reprimanded if they're not doing the right thing, where they really can just come and try new things out. Nice. A lot to unpack there. Uh, I'm going to unpack it. I want to get Jill in the mix. <laughs> yes. Um, clubhouse coordinator. Yes. Um, she's referencing the clubhouse here. Mm -hmm. Spotlight and snapshot what the clubhouse is all about from your perspective, mm -hmm. what the clubhouse coordinator does with the organization. So we are a part of uh, something called the Clubhouse Network. Um, there are actually um, 100 plus clubhouses around the world. Um, the flagship clubhouse is located in Boston, Massachusetts. And um, what we do, the goal of this space is, uh, first of all, for it to be drop-in. Youth come to us by choice when they want, for how long, for 
as long as they want. Um, so we hold hours after school. Um, we specifically hold hours between 3.30 and 7.30. So we see youth um, sometimes once a week for an hour. Sometimes we see youth for four hours every single day. <laughs> um, and so we really have an opportunity to, um, to form really, really deep connections and relationships with these youth. Um, we run on a group mentoring model. So the mentors who work with us in the clubhouse um, might work with one, one member you know, for, for those three hours on a specific project they might work on. Or a mentor might you know, help a group of friends who are interested in doing uh, the same project. Or they might work with five different youth at different points in time. So uh, the goal is for it to be explorative. Um, you know, a member might start out by designing a t-shirt, might transition into a workshop with drones, um, and then might decide to, you know, go onto the virtual reality set in order to create a painting. Um, and so the whole idea is that we want to be able to um, allow, allow for them to dream big, be curious, and, you know, and, and work with adults, not just, not just be taught, um, but to actually learn alongside uh, these really wonderful mentors that we have professionals in the community, grad students, undergrad students from UVA, from PVCC. Um, so we really do run and rely and appreciate our mentors. They are really probably, as, along with the youth, the heart of our, of our organization. Fantastic. Dean Lamb is giving you some props right now. Oh my gosh. Welcome yes. to the program, <laughs> Dean. Um, give it a like and a share of any of the 12 Facebook pages. Peaches says, 20 years. Kayla, I am getting old. Yikes <laughs> over here. Uh, Mark Perdue is giving you some props. Jennifer Hasher. Um, also a mentor. Rajiva. That's my husband. <laughs> uh, give you some props right now. Uh, all right, let me throw this to you. So recap again. When did you first start working for the organization? I started working, I've been C4K's first and only director, and I started October 1999. Okay, so this is awesome. So you've <laughs> seen this change. I have. October 1999, what were the challenges the organizations face, organiz organizations face, and, I, and I'm going to tie this into this, how have those challenges changed and evolved? Because you still have trials. You still have tribulations, but I'm sure that they have completely changed from October 1999. Well, October, my first day of work was in Washington, D.C. We had received a grant under the umbrella of the Boys and Girls Club to start this program called Computers for Kids. And so my first day was at D.C. trying to figure out what it means to run, a fe to manage a federal grant, having never had any experience in the grant grant arena or nonprofit arena. So you just got thrown to the fire. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I say I was, a, I'm their first director cause I was the only one, you know, foolish enough to, to, to sign accept up. the offer. Right. <laughs> so my, you know, in 1999, it was all about, there's this concept and the concept was, was developed by three community members and then written into a grant. And so I wasn't involved in the planning. I was involved with, hey, here's a grant and you've got to get it off the ground. So the challenges in 1999 were, where are we going to live? You know, when I, my first day at work after coming back from DC was in my living room with the, with the desktop computer that was owned by me. Um, so the first challenge was, where are we going to do this thing called Computers for Kids? And, you know, all the infrastructure, how are we going to train volunteers? So it's really just starting from, from scratch, scratch completely zero. from scratch. So that was the initial challenge. Um, and I think the thing that I most love about this job and why I can do it 20 plus years later is because it's always evolving. You know, we're always, we really try to pride ourselves in looking to our community, asking our young people and their families, what do you need? What, you know, what tools can we provide you? What assistance and how can we support you? And so the biggest challenge is just having to be nimble. And, you know, when you work for a technology nonprofit, things change and they change really fast. And so just ha being able to be nimble and make changes as the technology changes, as the needs of the schools change, as the needs of our community, of, of our future, you know, the, the employers in town change. Um, I love um, how you described the approachability of these here. 
So the barrier of entry is dropping. Right. These are becoming so approachable, so ubiquitous. Um, it's almost like an addiction. They're constantly in our hand. So what is going through your mind, the team's mind, the board's mind, mm -hmm. as you're like, oh my goodness, it's no longer go to a room in the house or go to a room at Computers right. for Kids. Right. Get on the computer, wait for that, that noise, that <laughs> Elon noise, that <laughs> right? dial-up internet, and it's now this. I mean, what was going through your mind then? Well, I, you know, I think what, I mean, we're excited now that their accessibility is, is not as big of a barrier. And it's, it's a positive. It, it still is a barrier. You know, you still have to pay to have internet service. We don't have free Wi-Fi everywhere. And so for some of our families, accessing Wi-Fi or the internet is still a barrier. But what we really want to focus on is all of us know how to be consumers of technology, right? Like we do it all the time. What we're really trying to do is make sure that the youth that come through our doors understand that they can be producers and not merely consumers of technology. So great, you want to play that video game, but let's pair you up with this mentor over here who can teach you how to design your own video game and learn some basic coding awesome. so that you have a skill that you can take beyond our walls. That's really, you know, C4K really wants to make sure that the youth that come through our doors have lots of options. And by exposing them to different technologies, to different volunteers, to people from all over the globe, from people in their community who can provide us future supports we're hoping that that will afford them more opportunities as they age out of high school. You know, this topic, and I'm going to work you in the mix here, um, Jill, this topic is so important. And here's why it's so important. We are being bombarded by major tech companies coming to Charlottesville. And you take Dairy Market and Dairy Central, and I'm going to throw this topic to you. Okay. We have Fortune 500 companies bombarding Charlottesville. We have Willow Tree expanding, Co-Construct expanding. We have seven of that, seven, and we wrote an analysis about this on I Love Seville, 7,000 to 9,000 new jobs coming into Charlottesville in the next five years. And these people that are coming like CoStar Group and Dexcom, CoStar Group is the largest digital real estate company in the world. It's headquartered in DC. They're opening an office in Charlottesville. Dexcom is the world leading provider of um, diabetes monitoring systems mm -hmm. that is opening up an office in Preston Avenue. So the, the, the macro question that I'm gonna throw to you after I throw a micro question to Jill is this. Is like you guys are, and your organization are giving the next generation a taste of what could potentially be on the horizon for them from STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And that foundation could literally lead to big time high paying jobs within the community, Absolutely. as opposed to these companies going outside of mm -hmm. Charlottesville to recruit talent and bring it to Charlottesville, which would further gentrify the community and further increase this wealth gap mm -hmm. that is very prevalent in Charlottesville, mm -hmm. Virginia. So that topic is going to come to you in a matter of okay. moments. I got Before an answer. That, I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. Before that topic goes to you, Jill, this question for you, STEAM, science, mm -hmm. technology, engineering, art, and math. We hear STEM all the time. I love the acronym with the A in it with art because it's often overlooked. As a father of a two-year-old, I would love our son, um, and my wife is doing a phenomenal job with him, I would love our son to have as well-rounded and as broad a perspective as possible, like yours, traveled, educated, um, you know, you have such a broad perspective here. Talk to us about the value of STEAM and how you're seeing it with kids of all ages and, and how it could impact their future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I love this topic. It's actually one I could get on a soapbox on for a very long time. <laughs> Please do. As an artist myself. But I think what's really important to, to recognize about the world we live in is that art is everywhere. I mean, nothing, you can't look at anything, you can't experience anything here, you know, anything with your senses uh, that you're experiencing has some kind of root and foundation in art. And I think that's really important to recognize and sometimes overlooked. Um, the idea behind art is that it's that creation 
component. It's the thing that's been designed, created, um, imagined, dreamed, um, that's been infused you know, into, into science, into technology, engineering, math. And so and that's, that's why we find art to be so important. It's, it's accessible, um, but it's also, it's also a way for our youth to learn what it means to, to redefine failure for themselves and to problem solve and to, and to really expand on their creativity. Um, and we see it as, as a place where, you know, you can access it at all these different points. Um, you don't have to be coming in. It sometimes can actually be detrimental to feel like you need to, to have a specific structure understanding of something because it then um, sometimes holds you back from being able to be fully creative. And so we see these young people walk through our doors who, you know, and some of their minds are just so untethered, which just leads to beautiful, beautiful results in the work that they're making. So while we talk about the fact that we definitely blend the arts within everything we do, we're still technology infused, right? So the world that we are coming into is one in which technology plays a huge role in, in looking at um, what it means to take everything to the next step. Um, and so um, we, we pay really uh, close attention to finding those links and those ways to connect you know, our, our artists to pathways in which they can then begin to understand how technology plays a role and how it really allows them to expand their own horizons and abilities. It's almost being like in today's ubiquitous, this is so ubiquitous and people are constantly on this or this or watching a TV or an mm -hmm. iPad. It almost seems like the creative side or the artistic side is being marginalized or undervalued in 2020. I'd say in a way. I think the bigger thing to understand is that I, I, you look at our, our educational systems and it, in every school you'll find a variety of different kinds of classrooms and I think there are some there are some classrooms in which we might struggle to be able to to eliminate some of that structure a little bit more than others I think the the reason why I I first taught art in a school was because I found myself able to it, to walk away from some of that structure and to be able to really cater to the youth that I was serving and to be able to then to bring curriculum to them that excited them within their space. So, I mean, coding, you can code within art. You can create artwork with coding. You can create artwork with math, with science. Um, and sometimes, you know, with the fact that you have, you know, in a math classroom at times, it can be really difficult to walk away from feeling like there are certain things because you know, there are certain things you need to know in order to be able to go to the next level, but where does creativity begin to take place? And so I think it can, you know, when you think about people who are, who are the innovators, who are the inventors of our world, they need to be able to think about how do I, I apply this within a completely new context? How do I, you know, put aside what, um, what I've been taught to do, which is to follow the rules, and how do I begin to break them in a way that's, you know, that, that will better our society? Great answer. Wow, <laughs> that was phenomenal. Um, all right, let's, um, you know what I love about doing this show is I love learning, and I'm so passionate about Charlottesville. I love, love, love this town, and it's not every day I get to sit someone, sit next to someone like you <laughs> who's got like this breadth of like knowledge of the community on so many different levels. Uh, may I ask when you first touched feet in Charlottesville, what year was it? Uh, 1971. Okay, 1971. So you have seen Charlottesville change dramatically. Okay, Charlottesville, and I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to learn from you. Okay. Charlottesville, I've been here since 2000, so almost 20 years for me. Um, it is changing so fast, and as a very young father, I am petrified that my little boy is going to grow up in this like homogenous community that is like so like, and I'll just cut straight to the chase, so like, you know, wealth driven, so like, you know, it's, it's gentrifying so fast 
the wealth gap is so large, mm -hmm. as large as I've ever remembered. And I can only see it with these seven to 9,000 new jobs coming to the community, that wealth gap getting larger and larger mm -hmm. and the gentrification happening faster and faster and faster. And here's where I'm getting at. If these new jobs are coming to our community, if these companies mm -hmm. that I mentioned aren't hiring within the community, that gap is gonna get exponentially larger. And I think what Computers for Kids are doing is giving, like I mentioned before, like a taste of what could be right. for a career and encouraging them to go on the path to pursue this you know, opportunity. And that allows these companies to hire within the community, which would then do the about face of gentrification and this wealth gap that I'm seeing. I'm getting out of the way. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I invite any of these companies that are moving into town or currently into town to, to be in touch with us. Um, we do lots of things to broaden our young people's horizons. One thing we do is take youth on field trips, taking them to companies. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been with the youth and they've said, wow, I can imagine myself here. And I think we... Awesome take for granted that if you don't see yourself or people that look like the people who live in your neighborhood in these places of employment, you don't think of that as a, as a career path. And it's so, an opportunity. Absolutely. And so we try to get youth into the community, showing them places that they could work, um, learning a little bit about these companies. We also are working to develop some programming for our older youth, for our high school youth. We would love to partner with companies to provide them um, with skills so that they could have meaningful summer employment, intern opportunities with these businesses. Again, they just need to be in these settings and understanding that they can contribute to these local companies. And the companies willing to invest in these local youth. These are youth that have were, you know, many of them born and raised in Charlottesville, probably will not leave Charlottesville if they can have a viable, viable life opportunities here. Do you think, and I met, I asked you this question off air, and you're getting a lot of props. Oh. And guys, I'm going to relay the comments that are in the comment section. And if you want to pass comments to Jill and to Kayla, just put it in the comment section. I will pass it along. Meredith Richards says, hi, Kayla. She's our founder. I'm glad you're telling the story of C4K on the I Love Seville show. I'm so proud of your leadership. Um, is it Layla, Michelle... You're going to have to help me with her last name. Yes, in D.C., yes. who, who is, a, is a friend and, and supports us from afar. Thank you, Layla. Thank she you, says, Meredith. you are absolutely fabulous. Oh, well, Writing everyone's on the too kind. Whitney Kernelli, um, watching the program, oh. giving you la love here. She is a Vista. She was a Vista volunteer with C4K for a year. Jennifer Hasher, Cecilia Cohen, to give it to you. Chad Hutchinson, <laughs> Jenny Hines, just to name a few. Awesome. And we have a lot of questions coming in <laughs> that we're going to get to. We will get Great. to these questions here. Um, 1971. How, this is a broad question. So you really just got around asking how old That's I was. Not I that, yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Not I, I, I see what you did. <laughs> okay. How have you seen for better and for tough Charlottesville change? I'm sure you've thought about this. I'm, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult because my lens was very different as a young person growing up in Charlottesville. And I, I think, I have to be honest, I was very naive to a lot of things that were going on in Charlottesville. I grew up, I'm a product of the Charlottesville City Schools. I'm a Burnley Moran Bobcat. And then I went on to Walker and then graduated from Charlottesville High School. And so, oh, Black Knights. Yeah. So, you know, um, but I remember when I first started C4K and was looking at statistics for the local schools, and I remember being astonished to learn that 50% of my classmates would have qualified for the free or reduced lunch program. And I think that's a misconception that a lot of people have about Charlottesville. I think we hear and see a lot about wealth, and often that wealth is in the surrounding counties, and I think um, it's programs like C4K and so many others in our community that are trying to help provide people with tools. I mean, you can, you can give people things, but if you can teach them to fish and provide them with the tools so that they can be successful. My, my favorite stories are of, um, you know, I have a C4K grad who um, is a homeowner now. 
And that to me is amazing. You yes, know, she is. grew up with a single mom who worked her butt off. And this young lady went to college, went to grad school, worked really hard, and now, you know, is married, has a new baby girl, and is a homeowner. I mean, those are the stories. That to me is a success when our students. Um, if they were to have a child, would not qualify for our program. Hopefully, we won't need this program, but until then, we'll be around. Dar is watching right now and says, Kayla is the woman. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Dar. Give it a like. That's why I'm not at the gym today. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He's going to take some pictures here. You smile at him. I'm going to throw this question over to Jill. So you have been in Charlottesville since August. Yes, right. since August. Um, you are extremely well-traveled. Um, I'm going to ask you to kind of give us uh, an itemization of where you've traveled. Okay. And then how Charlottesville, and this is mm-hmm. a tough question, how Charlottesville perhaps has matched up with some of these areas you've traveled from a perspective standpoint, mm-hmm. a diversity standpoint, a welcoming standpoint, a thought leader standpoint. Okay. Um, Well, I was born in Fiji, Suva, Fiji. I was only there for about six weeks, though. My parents (laughs) had lived there longer, but I was born at the tail end of that. Um, Then moved to Nicaragua in Central America. I was there for four years, so my first language was Spanish. Um, We moved to Arlington, Virginia for two years, so I learned English at a in a kindergarten that was a like a a dual. language immersion program. And then we moved to Mexico for three years. Um, I was in West Africa in a country named Benin, right by Ghana and Togo on the West Coast for two years. I was in South Africa, Johannesburg, South Africa for three years. And then we moved back to Arlington, Virginia for high school. Um, After, my, my parents moved to Poland right after I graduated. Um, high school, so I spent my summers over there working. Um, And then I was in India um, right after graduating college to do my student teaching, um, as well as some work at uh, the consulate in southern India. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where... Where I've so where you I've got lived. the goods. You've traveled <laughs> the world over here. There, there. Yes, but at the same time, I think what's been really, really wonderful about this program is that I feel like my my perspectives have definitely expanded in a, for a, for a, for many reasons. I think I mean. Uh, Kayla can also speak to just the diversity that we see in our own in our own youth and the places they've been and lived and um, their stories before coming to us here in Charlottesville and um, a lot of a lot of the places they're coming from are places I've never experienced and couldn't speak to and I think I learn a lot from what they bring to the table every single day um, we have I'd say right now we have a number of members who are are coming I who are Iranian and um, also from Afghanistan. Um, I've never been to the Middle East. I would love to go someday, but uh-huh. I have not. So I'm learning every day about you know their cultures, and um, it it's it's humbling to you know to to be an adult and feel like every day you're still learning from um, from the young children you work with. So. Um, I think when, when you think about Charlottesville, I, when you think about any city, really, I, I'm not sure if you can make any generalizations about a city or a town because it really, um, what really matters is the part, the part of the city or town that you're interacting within. The people. And yeah, yeah. No. Um, but uh, because you, you can find, you can find those perspectives. You can find any perspective in any part of the world. Um, and so what, what I think, what I think I do love about the city is the fact that everyone is, um, who, who I've met is just very open-minded, accepting, welcoming. I know when I moved to the U.S. for the first time, it was a really hard adjustment. You know, I was a freshman coming into an American school system, didn't know anyone. I found out my senior year that apparently they called me Safari Girl <laughs> because I just didn't look like that. That's them. not a bad thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I mean, I ate lunches in the bathroom because I didn't know how to deal with the cafeteria in an American school. And so it's... It, uh, all of that uh, to say that uh, America, as 
as diverse it is, as it is, there's, it's definitely, it definitely takes some adjusting to you know, understand how we do things, why we do things, how we make connections, who we connect with. Um, and so I think what, what travels really allowed me to do is really seek out um, and be curious about the people who are not like me um, and to really uh, treasure that and, and admire those who can bring fresh perspectives to the table as similar, as different as they might be to my own. Um, just having a chance to expand um, how I think and why I think it, um, it's something I get to do in, at work every day, um, whether it's with my wonderful colleagues or um, the mentors who work with us or the youth. Um, and so that's, I, I think Charlottesville for me has been C4K in a lot of ways. I mean, this, <laughs> my work is my life in a lot of ways. I, Kayla will say the same thing. Um, but um, I think that, that's the perspective and breath of fresh air that has, you know, that has really been Charlottesville for nice. me. Nice. Allison Stratton, giving you props right now. Uh, hi, Allison. Uh, welcome to the program, Allison. <laughs> a lot of comments coming in. We'll get to a couple comments. And then, Kayla, we're going to throw it back to you. This is a phenomenal organization. This is from James Watson. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a phenomenal organization. I hope the new IT companies that are watching and coming to Charlottesville reach out to this phenomenal program. Local talent is already here. It just needs an opportunity to thrive. I can't agree with that comment even more. Um, Keith Rosenfeld, welcome to the program. He's the owner of Hotcakes and Barracks Road Shopping Center. Um, this stat for you, I and help me understand this, because I take this for granted, and I think many, 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 many people do. The value proposition of having access at home to the internet and what it can do for a child from an educational standpoint and an advancement standpoint. There, and we take this for granted, there is, I have buddies that live in Nelson County, for example, and my buddies who live in Nelson County say, the folks along my street do not have access mm -hmm. to ISP, to internet, an internet service provider. So when we're doing work, when we're our kids, we either get in the car or go to the library, mm -hmm. or we go to school early, we try to figure it out. The value proposition of internet access at home and how it ties to education. So let me just thank you. I want to give a shout out to Jamie who just talked about the technology companies. He is a C4K mentor and I, I have to pause because I always tell people that C4K has the best volunteers in the world and we truly do. We could not do what we do without the support of our incredible mentors um, and I think that's why Jill probably felt, I mean, there is a special, I always say if I could bottle the atmosphere at C4K, I would never have to fundraise. It is truly um, a welcoming environment where you can just throw in pe random people. I mean, C4K is a hodgepodge of youth, of community members, and somehow they all come together and... Like Cindy Lynn? Like Nicole Brimer, like Caleb <laughs> Nelson, yes. that are watching and interacting with the program as we speak. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, just just a just a great cross section of our community, and it's and that's what I love. I love looking out from my office and just seeing such a broad um, array of people coming together for the for the betterment of our community. So, thank you to all of you um, who do that. Um, talk to us about the uh, the value of having access to the internet here. So one thing you mentioned is your friends in Nelson County and when they don't have access to the internet, you know, they get up early and take their child to the library or to school early and and that again is a luxury, right? You're a single parent and you work two or three jobs, you can't take your child to the library even if you don't have internet access. So you may have the best of intentions but the reality of it is that doesn't always work for single parent families or for our families who are refugees who don't have driver's licenses. So there are lots of barriers to our young people um, to getting access to the internet. And then even once you have access to the internet, if you don't have the skill set and knowing how to use the tools, I mean, how do a lot of us learn is from someone else or, oh, let's buy this software or this app. And if you don't have those resources, you're already being put at a disadvantage. And so C4K's 
purpose or one of its purposes is just to help level the playing field. The kids that we serve are brilliant. You know, they, they have lots of talents and lots of things to share. They just need to be brought onto the level playing field. Did you consider, um, and you have some board uh, members watching right now, um, did you consider at all a rebranding? <laughs> We're an advertising agency here. With this, I think about this constantly. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, walk me through it. Um, we are currently exploring that opportunity. Uh -huh. Um, when you are a grassroots organization sure, of who's trying to pinch every penny and trying to put as much of the funds that you raise into direct services for your youth, that's always something like, oh man, we should do this, but can we do it in such a way that it's not going to take away from programming? Course, resources. We run a really lean budget. And so, um, yeah, um, stay tuned there. Hopefully Technology will be for more. kids. <laughs> Stay tuned. Hopefully there will be more. I mean, the good thing is that we do have, um, we go by C4K instead of computers for kids, yeah. hoping that that takes away some of the uncertainty. Um, but I, I, we do have good recognition in the community. Yeah. When people ha hear C4K, they know, hear good things. They may not necessarily know what we do, which is problematic, but... We're working on that, and Jerry, if you want to help us out in any way, we will welcome your <laughs> Happy sage to. advice. I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, Layla says, uh, you have done an amazing job with this organization. Is it Assad? Assad says, Kayla Somerville is a true inspiration for all the women out there. Oh. Keep up the great work. Doug, what's up, buddy? He's watching down the street um, at NBC29. Doug Niven, welcome to the program. Um, CBS19 is also watching the show. So four different media outlets watching Thanks. the program as we speak. Um, where are we going to go? What's goals, expectations? You're a goal-oriented person. Um, you have team members that I'm sure you have like clear cut. This is what we want to see from C4K. What do you want to see? Well, it's so as it so happens, we are having a strategic planning session on Thursday, cool. where we're going to really try to focus on what do we mean by brighter futures, and 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 how are we going to do that? Um, we're sort of in a space where, and you know, for us, quality is more than quantity and so we just have to figure out how are we going to grow our programming to meet the needs of the young people we serve um, we have a lot of high school kids that would love to be engaged in our programming however due to work and school demands from work and school sometimes after school programming doesn't work does that look like we need to have Saturday sessions and if so what would that look like so we're going to be meeting with our board and with our staff and um, exploring a little more about how we want that, you know, those roles to change. Uh, Mark Purdue's got a comment for you. Uh, Mark says, I get frustrated when schools assign online homework and <laughs> research projects where your primary sources are online, all with the assumption that all kids have quality internet service. Keep up the great work that you guys are doing. You're making an impact in the community. Jill, you want to hit that one right there? I mean, I, I totally get it. I mean, I totally get it. It's just like assume now whether right or wrong, and I don't think necessarily in, in I'm going to come, I'm a glasses half full, positive person. Mm -hmm. Okay. I do not think that the assumption is being made from a ill intent type of place. It's just the assumption is, of course you have access to the mm -hmm. internet. Um, take that topic right there, Mark is talking about, schools assigning um, online homework and research projects, just assuming that there's access to the internet at the house. I can approach this within a, a, with a teaching perspective of being a teacher myself who has had to assign online homework for um, things like flex days in Minnesota when we're snowed out and we've used all of our snow days already. And at that point, teachers do assign online work that's expected to be completed at home. Um, and I think, I think the problem it goes a little deeper than that. I think every teacher you might ask would say, I would be, you know, if, if a student just told me, you know, I... I would absolutely make an alternative plan, but the problem is it's, it's not that. It's not that the teacher wouldn't. It's the fact that there is a, there's miscommunication, there's misunderstanding. A, a student does not naturally 
have this instinct to know, oh, you know, I can approach a teacher and just tell them this for a few reasons. First of all, there's Might stigma. be embarrassment. Yeah, there's stigma to it. Yeah. Um, and then there's also simply, you know, this mentality of, oh, well, I, I already know I'm going to fail. I'm not going to be able to complete it. You know, it's, it's not worth bringing up. And I think that can be really hard when you're faced with this one situation, when, a, when the teacher makes the first assumption of why a student might not have completed their homework that first time. It can be really easy, you know, in a class of 25 students to not notice that the reason, you know, one student did not complete their homework was because they could not do it. And so I think a lot of it too is having these really open conversations within schools too um, to, I, I think uh, teachers are perhaps aware but maybe just need to, uh, there, there's, a, there's an advocacy component here that not only youth have to take on but teachers do as well. They need to be aware that they probably have to ask that question, you know. All right, you know why? Why wasn't the homework completed? What what might have what might have gone on? I don't I don't know in the direction our society is going right now that that schoolwork on a computer is going to be eradicated. <laughs> you know, it's always no. going to exist. Yeah, you know, and so it's going to go deeper down that mm -hmm. rabbit hole. Exactly. So I think it has to be more along the lines of you know better communication, um, teachers being aware of of home life, you know, what's going on there. I think, tra I mean, tr a traditional school is separate from home, um, but there has to be some kind of understanding for, for youth to be able to succeed within a school system. Teachers need to be aware, teachers need to know the right questions to ask, and to be able to role model for youth what it means to ask those questions, how to self-advocate. Um, that needs to begin somewhere, and I think it, it begins with professional development, if nothing else, you know, for teachers, for staff, you know, for us even to begin doing that and working to, you know, help youth understand what it means to advocate for themselves. We have youth who come in all the time to work on homework as well. Um, and that is for a variety of reasons, whether it's they don't have someone at home to help them, whether it's they need the internet. And so it's also recognizing, you know, in my position that I, um, this is a great conversation because I know it's bringing something to my mind too that I should be doing more often, which is you know not just helping a, a member with their homework, but also asking the questions, you know, and making sure that you know they feel prepared to go back into school the next day and say something to the teacher if they need to be saying something. Empowering. Yes. Um, we're going to get to some comments, and then I'm going to okay. throw um, some more topics to you as we wind out. Then I'm going to ask you how everyone that's watching can get involved from a time fundraising, donation, contribution standpoint. So first, Lee Hughes, he says, Kayla is fantastic. <laughs> She's a phenomenal guest. Doug Niven says, hey, Kayla, keep up the phenomenal work that you guys are doing with C4K. Thanks, everyone. Um, how about this topic? Could C4K evolve into almost this like, almost this like um, epicenter where like you can take members, you call them members? Yes. Members mm -hmm. from young age, all the way up to hiring age, and then as they go from young age to hiring age, they're getting like almost like certifications and credentialed from you guys for the STEAM, science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, art, math, that they're having success with at your program, and then eventually almost having like a hiring component where like you guys are like have the connect, you're obviously extremely well connected, where like you guys have the hiring component where you can like almost like a test or be, mm -hmm. um, uh, I back this person, this person has the credentials or yeah. the justification to be placed within uh, the community at one of these jobs? I think that's, I mean, it's, it's not something admittedly that we have thought of, but I think, um, one of the things that C4K does well is that we meet every young person where they are. So we don't have a you walk in and you learn this and then you learn this. You walk in and we say, what do you like? What do you want to do? And then we provide the resources to get help them reach their goal. Um, as a team, as a program team, they do a really good job of not telling a kid, no, you can't do that. Sometimes, you know, we've had a kid come in and say, like, oh, I want to build a car. 
from scratch. <laughs> and so instead How do you of do that? instead of saying no, we say, well, let's start with you know, and and helping them reframe their expectations. Um, but I think that is something we are going to be having conversations about is um, by adding the clubhouse, which we did in 2015. That allowed us an opportunity to serve kids for more than a year or two. So really, with the goal of let's we bring kids in when they're in sixth we grade, grow with them. right? And so how can we grow with them and I think we are you know we have to have a conversation how when do we stop when does a relationship end currently it on a formal level ends when they graduate from high school but we've got kids who are first year in um, first generation college students that staff have gone to visit on weekends that we send texts to that come to visit us when they're in town for holidays so I think that's you know Lots to think about. Jaka, watching the program right ah, now, yes. um, says, you are absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Um, let me throw this to you. What are members most interested in? I mean, everybody seems to be now, I mean, everybody wants to be some kind of social media influencer. Someone wants to get on video. They want to take photos. They want to create. Um, what are your members primarily saying they want to do? You know, I think this would be a good question to I'm going to punt to Jill, but I, I think there's no one answer. And I think that the, the challenging part about what we do is that no one day looks the same. And so right now, the students that we're seeing most often are middle school youth. Um, a year and a half ago, we were serving more high school kids. And as you can imagine, what you do for a high school kid looks very different than for a middle school student. And so... Um, what they're interested in changes as often as the, the weather. technology, yeah, right, right, right. Well, what, I mean, what are we seeing? It's like they want to come in. What do you see? Is it podcasting? Is it creation? Is it video? Is it photo? Is it coding? I'd say probably the thing that holds most common within all these interests is that our members, the youth, just want to use their hands. You know, they want something tactile, they want something interactive, um, and that can look so many different ways. It can look like art, it can look like audio production, you know, they don't want to sit on a computer and make music, they want to use our keyboards, they want to be able to use our, our, our machine, the drum pad machine, you know, they want something, they want to learn how to do woodworking, you know, using the tools we have that are, you know, technology, but they want to be able to do something with their hands. I would say that that's probably the best way to encapsulate what the common theme that we're seeing. And I think a lot of our youth don't know what they want because they've not had exposure to it. And so that's, that's our goal. That's our, that's what we have to do is make sure that they have exposure. You know, we're not going to force you to do anything you don't want to do, but it is our job to showcase a lot of different technologies, a lot of different things, and so that you can choose for yourself what's of interest to you. I mean, I, I remember a young lady coming in, and you know, coding has a really negative connotation for a lot of our youth, and I think it's because it's something it's that, boring. well, I think it gets crammed down their neck in school, like we have week of code, and I think sometimes it's not always done in the most engaging way, so for whatever reason, they have this negative attitude toward it, and we had a young lady come in and work with a mentor, and she was really good at coding and had no idea. And she just really, you know, it, it, it was a spark for her. And we, you know, that's what we try to do at C4K is help young people find their spark. But if you haven't been exposed to it or you haven't tried it in a safe environment, I think that's really critical is that C4K is a welcoming, safe environment where you are encouraged to try. You are applaud it when you fail and that's what um that's what allows these kids to try things that they in, a, in another setting they may not be willing to do how about demystifying the stigma that coding and science and technology and engineering and math is male focused um, it's all about the mentors right? it's all about bringing in mentors Let's who look barriers. yeah it's all about taking them to places where not everyone looks the same very we're very intentional about that we're very intentional about making sure that the volunteers look like the students that we serve um, and that we you know have guest speakers again that sort of demystify what they think a scientist is or you know someone who flies drones 
I love it. Um, Andrew Jaspin, and I'm going to throw the question of how people can get involved with you here <laughs> in a matter of seconds. Andrew Jaspin's watching the program. He says, Kayla, big respect to you. You're a community leader and an awesome parent. Oh, Ashley Zenny. She says, hi, Kayla. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're not going to get to all these comments here. We are an hour in. These ladies crush, crush, crush it. Um, how can we get involved? There are so many ways to get involved. Um, our, we always are looking for volunteer mentors. You can be a one-to-one -one mentor or you can volunteer in Clubhouse. Um, if you go to our website, computers, the number four kids.net, there's um, under volunteer, shows you all the ways to get to volunteer, fill out an application and we'll follow up with you within one business day. Um, we survive by the support of our generous community. So we always are love when we get donations. Again, on our website, there's a way to donate directly. Um, if there are other skills or talents you have, we ask you to be in touch. We try to engage people in any way that's meaningful to them and to the organization. Um, we will archive the show on ilovesevil.com. You guys crushed it. Thank, Thank you, you for having and us. We, so much fun. We should totally do um, your idea. Absolutely. In the summer. Way more fun. Yeah. Way more where fun. Where we would have, what, you, uh, some volunteers and some members here? We would love to bring our youth because we, you know, if it weren't for school, we would of have course, a youth person, school. we'd have a young person here because we are big believers in youth voice and, you know, the community needs to hear directly from the youth. Love just, it. Just like we do. Love it. Love it. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Um, anybody that's watching... Get involved with C4K, please. Um, they're doing big time things for the community and they need our support. All we're trying to do with the show is to showcase the best of Charlottesville. C4K embodies those qualities. We will archive the show from start to finish on ilovesevil.com. Our director, Judah Wickhauer, will take the audio from the show and turn it into a podcast on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. For two weeks following today's program, we will syndicate this show across the I Love Seville network which is 17 Facebook pages, 17 Twitter accounts. We have an e-newsletter that goes out to 130,000 inboxes every morning at 11 a.m., the third largest Instagram in the community in I Love Seville, and of course on the website and on iTunes. We close with the same message every show, and that's to please embody the golden rule, treat the people in your life how you want to be treated yourself. The golden rule. Such a straightforward concept, but a concept that is so needed, especially in our country. Um, who is on tomorrow? So tomorrow, oh, this is a good one. Brian Ashworth, who is the executive chef and the owner of Ace Biscuit and Barbecue, Ooh. is going to come on the show tomorrow to tell the Ace story. And then Mike Keenan, who is the founder of the Juice Laundry, is going to come on on Thursday to tell the evolution of that brand. Thank you for joining us on the I Love CFL show. Enjoy your afternoon. Take care. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Painless. Thank you. Jill was like, uh, what, do, what do I need? I was like, <laughs> super easy. You guys crushed it. Jill, you did great. Uh, one more thing we're going to do. We're going to take.